All right. So here we go. Oh, looks like I'm first with this stuff I was looking at, which I thought was very interesting. So NASA has this upcoming telescope. Unfortunately, it's not up there yet. And the first thing Roman is going to do is look in a much bigger deep field, because one of the most famous pictures from Hubble was, um, I remember I was impressed by this. If you look at a patch of sky, there are more galaxies in that patch of sky than there are stars. And Hubble could see deep enough to show you that it just looks like some stars, but if you zoom in, there are all these galaxies there. And now they want to look at much wider regions, like 100 times as big with Roman to count how many galaxies are out there and see them. And I thought that's pretty cool. But what's really cool about it is the other project Roman's going to do, which will answer the problem of dark energy. And this is after I was out of astronomy when this happened, but it's very interesting because I mean, I've talked to people about this a lot. The reason why my, I and my whole gang pretty much left physics is because physics appeared to be finished. And I said, there's nothing more to find unless you can find some big hole in a current understanding. And here it is. The visible matter of everything we can see is only 5% of the universe. The invisible matter, the dark matter, which is what I heard about, is 27%. Dark energy is new. They didn't discover this until the end of the 90s after I was out of the game. And that's when, when I took this, they learned there was the Big Bang. The Hubble constant, which was discovered in like the 50s, is the rate of expansion of the galaxy and you can run that backwards and figure out when the galaxy was all the whole universe the expansion of the universe you can figure out when the whole universe was compressed down to nothing and that's when the big bang happened but what nobody knew and they were just launching satellites to try to investigate this when i was in grad school was is the expansion of the universe speeding up or slowing down and they launched an tel X-ray telescope. They took a bunch of measurements. And the end result is this number, which is like one if there's no change, bigger than one if it's speeding up, and less than one if it slows down. Their answer was like one plus or minus one. So that measurement didn't really answer the question. But around 1998, apparently, they did answer the question. And they discovered that the universe is not only expanding, but the rate of expansion is increasing. So something is pushing the universe apart faster and faster. And nobody has any clue how that could possibly be happening. And so they call that stuff dark energy. Somehow there is some kind of dark energy pushing the universe apart. And that's what they're trying to get to the bottom of here with this telescope. So it's really very interesting. There's, there's a kind of matter we do not know anything about. And there's a kind of energy we do not know anything about. So those are exciting things that may lead to, uh, to new areas of physics. And so they're going to do various measurements, which are about measuring the location of stars and galaxies in a bunch of places and then mapping out how this expansion has been going. And from the pattern of how it's been expanding over time, they're going to be testing various models to try to figure out what those mysterious parts of the universe are. So anyway, that's what I like. Right. And, and what's really interesting about the Hubble deep field is they specifically chose a part of the sky which was empty. They knew there were no stars, the completely black. Um, as far as anyone knew, there was just nothing there. So they trained Hubble in this one spot that was just like nothing. And of course, they found dozens of galaxies um, just sitting there. So, Yep. Yep. The galaxies are all around us. Anyway, so SMS fishing. You might be on mute, Irvin. Uh, I'm not on mute. All right. I just see that you still have your dark energy thing up. Uh, but uh, SMS fishing, yeah, I found this this nice little uh, to read about how they work and and why are why are, do people fall for them so easily? It's really like the psychology behind it that's used to trick people to clicking on links and and going to them. Mm -hmm. It's one of those interesting reads. It's, it's always the same advice that we always give people. Don't be quick to click on links just because you got them. Actually review them. Don't just, don't just click away or just because you get it as a text message. Don't, don't just click on it. Think about what you're doing before you do it. Uh, but it's an interesting little study. Of course, if you're using an iPhone, it probably can't really exploit you, right? I mean, there's not that many vulnerabilities on the iPhone in the browser. Not if you keep your stuff updated. Not if you keep your stuff updated. Yeah. But not everybody keeps their stuff updated. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. And then Caitlin's got pseudo. Oh, yes. I heard some stuff about this. Oh, you're on mute. 
Yes, thank you so much. Yes, so sudo is in the news again. Uh, there's another um, bug in sudo that could theoretically allow for some pretty extreme uh, privilege escalation. Um, Yay! Yeah, I know, isn't this fun? Uh, so the way it works is that uh, in the code that handles the command line arguments, um, it will uh, filter out and parse through escape strings like backslash n for new line. Uh, especially if you use the um, dash she command for the shell mode in, in um, sudo. Uh, now, where this bug comes in is that if you have a backslash at the end of the uh, statements coming in, it'll read the backslash and then the null zero adds a single character and then continue the buffer. Uh oh, so we got a nice little buffer overflow. And through that buffer overflow, of course, you can. Uh, um, do lots of bad things, start writing to memory where you shouldn't be able to write, um, start executing code with pseudo privileges and get a nice little privilege escalation. Oh, so the backslash at the end of your input removes the null. Exactly. That's awesome. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Is there like a simple uh, proof of concept code you can run? I don't know yet. Um, they do have the code in the article I linked yeah. uh, where the bug is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure there's already stuff on GitHub um, of people showing how to how to do it. But yep. And this, so anybody that hasn't updated their Unix recently has got this privilege escalation. Yeah. Everyone, update your your Unix based systems ASAP. Yeah. Yeah. Although there's an endless chain of these uh, privilege escalations, but anyway. Well, this one is famous and getting around fast and is um, yeah, just really bad. Yeah. And then, of course, the big news, GameStonk. <laughs> GameStonk. Yeah. That, of course, being Elon Musk's single word tweet with a link to Wall Street Bets. This it red. Been taken down? No, it hasn't been taken down. Oh. No, it hasn't been taken down, but it seems like every incumbent Wall Street institution wants to blow this up. This has been the most interesting story to me, uh, I think, so far, at least post-insurrection. And uh, there are so many levels to it. Uh, on the one hand, it reminds me of the, the energy around Anonymous and LulzSec 10 years ago. Um, but of course, it's in the financial industry. And I know just about nothing about investing so, uh, and the stock market. So this is definitely not my area of expertise. But uh, it's been interesting that so much of the media coverage of the story has been, oh, look at these naive uh, YOLO investors on Reddit, random people on the internet who are getting suckered into this uh, pyramid scheme and investing in this worthless company. GameStop, just to provide a little background, of course, is this fairly sizable uh, company that has a bunch of about 500 stores, mostly in strip malls, selling games and consoles, gaming consoles. Many of the games are used. And I don't have a, a history of paying good prices for buying those used games. So there isn't a lot of love for this company. And they've been closing stores for years now. And obviously the market is moving away from the brick and mortar retail model, especially for games sort of institutional investors have been counting on GameStop going bankrupt, which it may well do eventually. And in order to capitalize on GameStop's eventual failure, these institutional investors have been shorting shares in GameStop, meaning that they're betting that the price of the shares will continue to go down. When it goes down, they make more money. When it goes up, however, if the price of the shares goes up, then they're in a bit of a pickle. And so, although there have been a lot of these news stories about how GameStop's uh, rise in price has been all about dumb uh, internet uh, people, Redditors, there's actually a real sound uh, invest investing logic to this incredible rise in the share prices of GameStop. And, uh, I found this thread from this guy named Josh Gross, who I have no idea who he is. He could just be another ill-informed internet personality, but this is the most reasonable explanation that 
to me, a non-expert in this uh, that I've encountered. And what he's saying here in this long thread is that even though GameStop isn't a extremely successful company right now, it's actually not that badly off. They have enough cash on hand to cover all of their debts. And so that means that they are not just about to go bankrupt, far from it. They can keep going for some years. However, because certain hedge funds have been so hellbent on making money off of uh, GameStop's eventual collapse, they've been driving the price down by continuing to make these, um, placing these shorts on the stock. And so, um, just after the, the start of the pandemic, price was already down to about $2 a share. And since then, of course, it's been going up, albeit slowly, and it's shot up very, very recently. And the reason why it's shot up is not because a bunch of people on Reddit piled onto this and tried to make a quick buck as day traders. It actually has to do with what the short sellers did to themselves. And that's because when you uh, uh, execute a short sale option, what you are doing is essentially borrowing shares from somebody else. And uh, that means that you have to give those shares back to the counterparty sooner or later. Uh, there's a fixed term for this. It might be a couple of weeks, it might be a month, it might be a few months. But at some point you have to give those shares back no matter what the price is. If the shares go down in price, then that's no problem. You can do that very easily and you can clear a profit doing that. You, you borrow the shares and then uh, sell them at a higher price and then buy them at a lower price later on when the price has gone down and then return those back to your counterparty. But what happened here was enough people realized on Reddit that, um, that uh, GameStop was not uh, in danger of imminently going out of business and that so many people, so many institutional investors had shorted GameStop that there were more shorts uh, for more shares than there were shares freely traded on the market. So in other words, when these uh, contracts came due and the short sellers absolutely had to return them to their counterparties, they could not get those shares at all because they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. They weren't there. And so that meant that these short sellers had to bid up the price to, the, to these extraordinary levels so that they could just get their hands on a few shares mm -hmm. to fulfill their contractual obligations. Well, that's a very yeah. interesting story. I've heard yeah. a very different story from reading the mainstream media coverage. Right, right. And that, that's been a frustrating thing for me. So uh, whoever this Josh Gross fellow is, it seems like it's a, a very plausible explanation. And um, I mean, the story doesn't even end there. Uh, apparently, uh, one of the, the uh, main characters in the, the, the book and, not, uh, and movie, The Big Short, Dr. Michael Burry, was yeah. an early investor in this. He got involved in this, and he just cleared uh, something like $170 million on this. Um, Elon Musk, he has skin in the game too, because one of the big um, hedge funds that was short selling GameStop called Melvin Capital. Melvin Capital also shorted Tesla stock some years ago. Mm. And he has a chip on his shoulder about that. And so uh, I think uh, Elon Musk has not forgotten and he was aware of this and he wanted to sink Melvin Capital too. Mm. Uh, and, and then on top of that, uh, Robin Hood, this free uh, stock market trading app, allows you to, to perform trades uh, with no transaction cost. Uh, it halted trading in uh, GameStop, um, and there's a lot of outcry about this, but it turns out that game, uh, 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 Robin Hood's number one customer is not the people who trade on the platform, but is another company called, um, uh, well, I'm forgetting the name of that, but this other company um, had uh, uh, loaned a bunch of money to Melvin Capital. And so they put pressure on 
uh, Robin Hood to halt transactions because they didn't want to lose any more money on this, this loan to um, Melvin Capital. Yeah, I heard that story. I wasn't too, and it's hard to know what the truth is here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many issues with the Robin Hood. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I mean, another issue with Robin Hood is being in the middle like this. You handle transactions, and there's a delay, and sometimes people promise to buy things, and then it turns out they don't have the money. So when things are moving this rapidly, you can end up holding the bag. And they right, actually had to go and get another billion dollars in a hurry to have more cash on hand to handle the financial risk of this. So there is some sense in saying that when a stock goes up by a hundred fold in a couple of weeks and there's no actual basis for that, our financial risk is too high and we have to stop the trading. That's well, not necessarily corruption. Well, my understanding is that Robin Hood is not in that position, actually. They are not the market maker. Um, instead, they're just the middleman and they're selling data to other firms that are the market makers, the and market makers being the ones that um, affect the transaction between seller and the buyer. Um, and so, in fact, the FCC just fined a Robin Hood a huge amount, I think it's like $100 million, because Robin Hood was not forthcoming to the users of its app about its relationship and how it was selling their trading data to other companies that uh, do the market making. Ah, uh, well, that would explain how they make money. Yeah, well, yeah. just like every other internet company, they make money by selling your data. Exactly, exactly. This is a classic example of uh, you are the product. Right. Well, anyway, there certainly is a, a lot of people are comparing this to cryptocurrency, which I think is very fair. Cryptocurrency is the same. You're bidding at a huge price when the thing is actually worth zero. Yes. And yet you can make money there as long as it doesn't bother you to be like flying around in the air with nothing under you. <laughs> right. It goes and, up and, and down. But... Yes. And so some people apparently have made a great deal of money. Like uh, one of the, the first people on Reddit to start this back in 2019, uh, going by the handle of deep effing state, uh, they've yeah. cleared over $15 million. On yes. This. But you can make money in pyramid schemes too. It's just that yes. ninety of the participants don't, and that's all any of this is. I mean, trading right. something with no intrinsic value is just a pyramid scheme. As long as you can lure in a bunch of suckers and you sell after the first flood of suckers come in, you make money. But yes, but the of you here the is that the, the suckers were the, uh, the these investment firms that were short selling it because yeah. they didn't pay close enough attention. Yeah, and so. There's been this really uh, the sense of uh, the self-congratulatory tone on the internet about how we stuck it to these hedge funds, these billionaires. Yeah, but, but not unless they sold out, they didn't sucker them. This is the same thing with Bitcoin. A bunch of people feel rich because they have a big number in Bitcoin, but if you didn't sell it, right, you don't really have that money. <laughs> right, right. And if you if you have a position but you can't sell it because Robin Hood is not allowing you to, then you're pretty much stuck. And you well, screw. Robin Hood allows people to sell. They just don't allow people to buy anymore. Oh, the, the, to buy. Yeah. Yeah. And, Although, yeah. The, there's another level to this, too, in that um, the real money behind GameStop are the huge multinational uh, investment firms. Mm -hmm. uh, the number one shareholder is Black, outside of the... It, the uh, outside of GameStop itself is BlackRock, which has over eight trillion dollars in management. <coughs> they own thirteen percent of GameStop, so their holdings just went from a few hundred million dollars to now well over three billion dollars. And so they're the ones that are profiting the most. And so this is not exactly a story of the little guy beating uh, Wall Street at its own game. Wall Street still won. It's just a different part of Wall Street. Well, you know, one, one thing I recommend to people is Sharia law. One of the rules of Sharia law is you are not allowed to have any money unless you did a day's work to earn that money. So you never participate in anything like this, and your life is a whole lot calmer. <laughs> well, there's certainly something to be said for honest work and how this doesn't exactly resemble honest work. Well, this is basically On the other hand, it's probably never going to happen again either. So, Oh, no, it's already happening that... like two other stocks right now. Yeah, but the circumstances are different with those, and it's not as extreme. The so. cryptocurrency market has been nothing but stuff like this pretending. Yeah. It's yeah. going on. 
And you can just go to Vegas or bet on a sports team and you have the same experience, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the gambling madness. And it, right, well, yeah. uh, I was going to say, the, the thing I think this really exposes is where the power is in, in when it comes to Wall Street. Um, you know, this happened and all the Reddit people, all the people that went on to Robinhood, they did nothing wrong. You know, you can go out and buy as much game stock, GameStop stock as, as possible for whatever reason you want, right? That's totally legal. Um, but if you read like the New York Times, you read the, ma the mainstream narratives that's going out on like Fox News, uh, you know, they're saying things. I read this headline this morning that, you know, lazy, greedy people on Reddit are just, you know, buying up all these stocks. And I'm just like, what, as opposed to the uh, hardworking, altruistic Wall Street, you know, bankers who are, <laughs> who are doing this stuff. I mean, they, they completely control the narrative. And not only that, I mean, they got, uh, yeah, they got Robin Hood to, you know, completely like stop people from doing a completely legitimate transaction, right? They said, no, you can't do that anymore because we're losing money, right? And then uh, they also, uh, you know, they, when people then review bombed uh, the, uh, the app for, you know, oh, blocking them, yeah. Google came in and just removed all the negative, negative things. And now Congress is gonna get involved. I mean, there's just so much power with these, um, with these big financial firms, if you did not think the system was rigged, you certainly do now. And that's what this has exposed. It's not so much that, oh, people are getting rich and things are getting shaken up. We're really exposing the bias inherent in the system uh, that really allows uh, the, the concentration of wealth in these large investment firms um, to you know, be maintained through institutions in our society. You know, in the early 80s, I worked with a woman from East Germany. And it was communist nation. She came to work in America and she asked me about the stock market. And I said, well, you know, you're working at a company and they have this stock and people just buy and sell it. And if at any time people sell it, then the company goes broke and you're out on the street and there's no regulation or anything. And she said, I wouldn't want to live in this terrible system. <laughs> and she's kind of got a point. There's this idea of a free market, but the free market is howling chaos. So then we have regulations and then you know that's where we are. We're the same thing with chaos on the internet, internet discussion. We're trying to figure out how to regulate it. Nobody really wants complete freedom because it turns into the wild west with lunatics just doing crazy things. Well, no, it's that's not the issue, and we're going to get to that in, a, in one of my later articles. It's yeah. not the lunatics doing crazy things. It's um, in fact, the, I, I really don't think the redditors going on buying GameStop stock is is that big of a threat to our economy. Like as as Alan said, a lot of people actually did profit, including a lot of big Wall Street people. It's just the people who were originally thinking they were going to profit didn't. Um, well, and so I, don't, I don't mean to blame the people on Reddit. The people yeah. that I regard as the hazard are the short sellers. I mean, the short yeah. sellers and the margin traders are what makes the market very unstable. They're what caused the crash in 1929. Right. And, and well, yeah, it's going to say that it's these big institutions that are kind of manipulating markets, manipulating people. Yeah, uh, that's the real problem. It's not that there are a bunch of crazy people doing whatever. There are forces at work, on, you know, on the Internet and in our institutions, you know, to rig the system, you know, to make well, people believe certain I'm things. Called crazy. In fact, I saw one card comment about this. It was pretty good. He said, if you want to understand this, watch The Wolf of Wall Street and you will see what these investors are like. They're just taking drugs, gambling with the money, laughing at people. That's who these guys are. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, well, let's, let's, take, let's carry on. But anyway, that's a big story. Everyone's very excited about it. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I don't have any money in it. So Apple, the CEO, is on here condemning people. Facebook, everybody's dumping on Facebook lately. And it's sounding, some people think Congress might actually do something to Facebook. Although I think the possibility of Congress actually doing anything about anything is very small because they're just totally locked in partisan gridlock and they just won't do anything like they haven't for the last 10 years. But anyway, a lot of people would like to see Facebook broken up or punished. And uh, the companies that do not depend on invading your privacy, which is pretty much Apple and Microsoft, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else, um, can take the moral high ground and say, you have to stop uh, exploiting everyone's private data. And what Apple can do, which they're thinking of doing, is putting in more restrictions on what you can snoop on in Safari and on iOS, uh, just like Microsoft did it in Edge. Uh, they can, to some extent, choke off their competition by enforcing privacy controls in the browser. 
And they've been talking about it, but so far they haven't seemed to actually do it, which I think is because Google is so smart that they overcome every privacy defense they put in, in a hurry and continue to snoop on you. But anyway, unless we start breaking up these big companies, it's gonna be that way, just uh, the three or four companies battling it out to determine our fate. And, uh, and speaking of uh, privacy, yeah, Proton Mail made a, a, a joint uh, letter to the EU, along with a bunch of other folks, to say no to uh, making the backdoor in encryption. Oh, they tried to backdoor Proton Mail. Uh, well, their Proton Mail is, is standing up with those other Threema, Tesla, Tutanota, saying that uh, please don't put a backdoor. Because oh, I heard of this. They're trying to require an encryption, but they haven't done it yet, right? Right, right. They haven't done it yet. So those four uh, put up a big old letter saying, "Don't, don't do it," because what you think you're doing is not is, is not what's going to happen. Well, yeah, I think that's what I, I mean. They always think they can give the government a backdoor, and that'll be great, and that's not really so great. Right, and that's exactly what they're saying: is that no, it's not going to be great. Yep. All right, and so. Got this one. Yep. Um, so I didn't know this, but ebooks are costing 500% more than print books during oh, that's COVID. Horrible. Yeah. So, okay. So I was thinking, I always kind of assumed that ebooks were going to be somewhat cheaper. If it may be the same price, because we all know that the textbooks are not, the price is not the paper, it's the you know, work that goes into it and stuff like that. Um, but uh, we, everyone knows that these college textbooks you know, manufacturers, you know, have a racket, right? They know you have to buy their textbooks. And so they charge outrageous prices as much as they can uh, to make sure that, you know, they profit as much as possible. And of course, uh, these wonderful people are deciding <laughs> that uh, uh, the best way to, to help people during COVID um, and, if, and people who now require eBooks is to, of course, jack the price up 500% more than print books. Just like um, and, yeah, just like insulin. Um, and so nearly 3,000 librarians, academics, and students have now signed an open letter uh, calling for a public investigation into the unaffordable, unsustainable, and inaccessible, unquote, academic ebook market, which good for them. Um, I mean, one of the hardest things about teaching the public is figuring out how you can get the material super cheap because there's so many people that just want to make money off students and just, you know, in, un in unethical ways, so. Well, you know, I know a teacher, I would never dare divulge this person's name who actually shows students how to pirate copies of books online to avoid this. Yeah, oh, that, oh that yes. That's the that... kind of horrible thing that will happen when you put this kind of pressure on people. Yeah, I, I know it. And that, but well, what's funny too is that, um, I mean, I know that the laws are a bit more complicated than this, but teachers are allowed to pirate, um, um, to a certain degree, uh, materials for their classes. So if there's like an article mm -hmm. or a set of articles, you know, you can yeah. photocopy it and send it out to your students. Um, so yeah, there, but there's not a teacher. But yeah, not not an entire book. I know, but, <laughs> but there there is there is an acknowledgement that you know a certain amount of of piracy goes on in the industry, anyways. But I would I would never pirate, and I'm sure none of us would ever encourage our students to pirate. So. I always tell them I cannot officially endorse any such activity. That's what I tell them. I'm very firm about it. I, I say, you know, anyone who pirates is technically breaking the law and they should be in jail because you yeah. cannot ever break the law and it's, it is illegal and immoral to do so. Mm. Well, this reminds me of like the uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene who wanted to take a gun and kill other congressmen and the Republican Speaker of the House said, I'll talk to her and that will they'll have no more of this misbehavior. <laughs> Sure. Yes. Yeah. You know, you would think that a lot of the people in Congress would be more upset that a bunch of people are trying to get them killed, uh, but they seem oddly calm. And I have to, I have to applaud whoever their therapists are. I mean, they're just doing a great job. I'm. You know, who's not calm is my favorite AOC. She gives them hell. <laughs> yeah. She seems really upset that the bunch of yeah. people that, that her colleagues are, have tried to get her killed. I mean, I don't, yeah. Why Why get so upset about such trivial things? I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, she's the one that speaks up in very clear, very stern terms. Mm -hmm. She doesn't even use the bad words that I would probably use in her position, you know. 
yeah anyway yeah, but but yeah oh. i did hear oh, i did hear about that one um that marjorie person um and yeah. oh god oh she was um claiming that laser beams from space yeah started the california wildfires um oh, really yes like and Jewish so, laser beams controlled well, by well, the jews yeah well i mean it was wink wink controlled by the jews because yeah. it was controlled by corporations that are wink wink have jewish connections but yeah. um the uh but yeah she, she made some statements saying that these laser beams hit the ground and she said because people saw these blue beams hit the ground where the california wildfires started oh, yeah. and so as as a scientist, as or someone who works with science, scientists, I should say, I, I do want to remind people um, that, well, one, we, we don't have the technology to send laser beams to California to start fires yet. Uh, maybe one day, <laughs> but not yet. Uh, but secondly, um, uh, there actually is, I, I think she might be right. However, there's there's a technical name for that electrostatic discharge, yeah. energy discharge. Um, the, the term that the scientists use um, is uh, lightning. Yeah, no, but I saw those blue beams from the from the space station. They took pictures. There's a kind of lightning that looks like yeah, a beam, and, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and it like sometimes goes upwards too. Yeah, no, um, yeah. For those wondering, yeah, it's not actually uh, firing laser beams from space. It's it's a phenomenon called lightning. That it's often accompanied by a loud sound known as thunder. I would. Um, it might be a difficult concept for some of our senators to understand, but um, that's that's definitely what it was. Yeah, we, we might have to do a whole news thing on lightning and thunder. You know, this could just be the elite's cover story to hide the fact about the alien lasers that are taking over our mind because you're in on it. You know, alien lasers would be more probable than man-made you know, lasers. Uh, I mean, I, I can't even begin to explain why it's not a thing. Um, yeah. We went through all that with Star Wars and Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah. No, you. The the problem, of course, is not only do you have the atmosphere to contend with, uh, shooting laser beams from space, um, but the inverse square law still applies to laser beams. Believe it or not. Um, so if you're trying to fire laser beams from 50 miles away or 100 miles away, um, it requires a lot more power than <laughs> you know than you yeah. would imagine. And of course, power delivery in space is really difficult. And Yep, this is why missiles exist. Missiles are the most effective way to actually deliver a lot of energy to one spot. Exactly. Um, and yeah, so the way, just in case anyone's wondering, so there are lasers that are used in warfare, uh, but the way they work is you, we cannot deliver enough power even on the ground to these lasers to fire them as weapons. Uh, they basically have vats of chemicals that react and then fire off the beam from those vats of chemicals. Um, and the chemist would have to explain how that works, but. Yeah, even on Earth, we, we just can't <laughs> deliver the electrical power to uh, have laser beam weapons. Uh, there are some I've heard, but they, it's like a, it's like a 50 tons. I mean, the one I used when I was in laser physics was a very small version of it. You have many layers of amplifiers, but they're not practical at all. No, no. Um, and but yeah, but would that would that work as a weapon? And would it work from space? Even the one you worked down on a lab? Well, it know, did work Earth. as a weapon. You could shoot down an airplane with it. They said, but oh wow, but it has to be like a ground emplacement. It's not portable at all. Right. And it takes like a whole power plant to power it. Oh, well, there you go. Yep. I mean, it's a missile or a bullet is much more effective. Much. Yes, much. Um, yeah. I, I don't know of any, any kind of laser that would uh, be, uh, that you could power with solar panels in space yeah. that would do any kind of real <laughs> cool Yeah, that's stuff. one. That's one part of science fiction we're not going to get is like the handheld laser weapon. <laughs> What, you're saying we can't use the sun's rays and put them against mirrors and, and target it to a location like they did in the, that one horrible, horrible Batman movie? There was, a, there was a rumor that they did that in the Coliseum, right? Everybody held up their shield and focused the sunlight. You could actually do that in principle. You could make a big mirror that focuses the sunlight into one spot and makes it really hot. Uh, unless there are clouds overhead. Yeah, but I mean, that's how the, the more efficient solar panels work. They focus the sun to make a really hot spot. Anyway, so you're going to expect your room with Wi-Fi. What's the deal yes, this, here? This article title really undersells the technology. What it should read is that you can use Wi-Fi for X-ray vision. Oh, yeah. This is a really, really interesting application of Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6, MIMO, 
multi-path propagation, signal propagation. Mm -hmm. This company, Origin Wireless, has a product that they claim allows you to monitor movement in a structure and it can be used as a physical security system. And all you need to do is plug it into the wall and it sends Wi-Fi signals uh, in the five gigahertz ISM band. And somehow using some really fancy digital signal processing, um, the sensors are able to detect if there is somebody in a space and if they are moving around. And so you can use the, this app on your smartphone and if there's movement in your house while you're not at home, you know there's an intruder. And all it requires is Wi-Fi that's being sent out, uh, Wi-Fi signals that are being sent out by this base station and are being processed by the sensors. And a total process. and a laser. Yeah, and the lasers. You can't forget the lasers, the space lasers, absolutely. But this whole system of one base station, two sensors is only $179. So I don't know if there's a subscription fee on top of that. But I have to assume that they're using off-the-shelf components. They're not using custom silicon yeah. to, to implement this. And so this is like the next level of Wi-Fi. Now we can use it for X-ray vision. That's how I want yeah. to see this. Well, this makes total sense to me. When I was a kid, we had television, radio re reception, and you had to like stand next to the antenna to get the signal. I mean, your body affects the radio waves. Right, right. So, I mean, it really makes total sense. You prefer, it seems like you wouldn't even need to cost this much money. Just your ordinary Wi-Fi signal, I'm sure, is is affected by people walking around the room. So, Yeah, and so it'll be interesting to see, once this gets out on the market, just how um, accurate the system is. You know, does it get tripped up by, say, large pets moving around? Or does it get tripped up by curtains blowing in the, the breeze? But... Um, yeah, they, they claim that they're using artificial intelligence and all that fancy jazz. So. And I don't even know why you'd have to do that. I mean, if you don't have anybody walking in your room, the signal would just be constant. If somebody walks in the room, it would vary. I don't think right. you need the AI or anything. <laughs> Unless it's trying to map out the room and like show you the per this thing went from point A to point B. Yeah. Maybe then? I saw something a few years ago where they say the police can do this from outside. They can shine something in through the wall and they can sort of see an outline of someone, like what room mm. they're in. Mm. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about this technology. So, um, I imagine that since it's at, available at a consumer level, at such a cheap price, it's been available to uh, intelligence agencies for years. Oh, yeah. I think this is, this is well known. I mean, Wi Fi does go through walls to some extent. And you can get a, a picture, but it's low resolution because it's low power and the wavelength is several centimeters. So, you know, you can't like identify a face or something, but you can tell a human from like a dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too, that makes Wi-Fi really special is that it can go through walls, but it's also reflected by walls. So you can sort of get both um, in, this, in this frequency range where you can you know, see where the walls are, see where the people are, see where the bodies are, but also kind of everything becomes sort of translucent. Yeah, and I, the application I heard was in like a hostage situation where they're holding hostages and you'd like to know where the guys with guns are and where the hostages are and stuff like that. You could tell that from the outside to some extent. And I think you can see metal objects like guns more clearly than people. So you can sort of tell like whether they're carrying a big gun or something. So it's got obvious value. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised, um, like, you don't see, um, like, antenna arrays uh, with this technology, where you can do something similar to radar, um, okay. but I don't know. I think that's kind of, there are versions of it around. Anyway, that's good stuff. And then uh, this, I was amazed. I taught a web application hacking class, I think, yesterday, and afterwards, one of the students said, hey, I found this vulnerability on a real website. And I checked it and I said, boy, that's one. And I said, but that's cross-site scripting. Nobody cares. They probably, nobody will even pay attention if you notify it. And I Googled and I found that that same company had had bugs reported five years ago by these guys, which they patched. 
And I said, well, you should contact these guys. I didn't know about this. This used to be a site I did hear about that just had a list of all the cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. They just had sort of a forum with, because every, like 80% of all websites have cross-site scripting. They're all over the place. Nobody cares. It actually can lead to some real problems, but nobody bothers. And so they just made forums of everybody posting all the cross-site scripting. And these guys five years ago formed a company which will contact them for free and tell them about it and encourage them to fix it and then try to encourage them to like give you some reward. Even people are not running a bug bounty program and apparently they're relatively successful at this. This is the classic white hatting that I've done and given talks about that most of the security community says, this is wrong, you should never do it. You'll just get sued and punished and you'll never get anything fixed. And they claim they're getting stuff fixed. They claim they got like thousands of bugs fixed this way. So anyway, it's pretty interesting. And this one of my students is gonna go through them and report a bug and we'll see if it gets fixed. Cool. One thing I don't understand is how they make any money. They don't charge any, they don't charge the vulnerability researchers or the companies any money. So I wonder how it's going to survive. But anyway, it is pretty awesome. And they're reporting the kind of stuff that I've been finding for years and other people are finding simple bugs like SQL injection and cross-site scripting that are all over the place. And usually you can't get anybody to care. Anyway, I thought that was fun. Cool, cool. Yep. And then we got Malvon. I had to look at this twice to understand what it was. Me too. <laughs> it's a website dedicated to the research of security vulnerabilities within malware itself. <laughs> so you can take over machines that have already been taken over by somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Which has got to be illegal. <laughs> it's got to be illegal, but I'm sure that it's fun. Well, you know, I thought my first thought is I don't know how I could use it because I can't give students real malware to install in their machine to then practice taking it over again. It is kind of interesting, but I'm not quite sure how to use it. Within a VM? I I don't really like giving my students real malware to handle it all because if they make a mistake with it, then they start spreading it and then we're all in trouble. Well, yeah, I guess. At SANS, they give them real malware, but you know, they're not a community college. A lot of my students, you know, I have students come into my hacking class and say, hey, I was doing my homework at work last night. And I'm like, uh, at work? He said, yeah. And then they got mad at me. I said, where do you work? Oh, I work in a bank. And I'm like, dude, you were doing your hacking project at work in a bank? That's why I wouldn't want to give them malware because they'll do things like that with it. So, uh, for example, this next week, uh, my Security Plus class is going to talk about malware. And, and I actually give them real malware to work with. But... I have specific instructions for them to run it in a cloud VM, in a nested cloud VM. It doesn't have internet access. Yeah, well, the uh, problem is some of them don't read the instructions. Yet. I know, but <laughs> I, I have like I have a series of, of ways to keep them from doing the wrong things. Uh, not that it works 100%, but I'm trying. Yeah, well, I'll be interested to, to hear about it and interested to read your book when you get out of prison and everything. It'll be fun, so. Okay. What could go wrong? But yeah, this is an interesting site. Well, you know, people are getting more bold about taking risks. Like um, I was I was checking this vulnerability. They said, aren't you breaking the law? And I said, oh yeah, 10 years ago, I wouldn't even have tested this on somebody's website. Now I've sort of understood that there's uh, only a small amount of risk and I could actually defend my actions. There's no complete, pure, legally safe activity. You know, there's some chance whatever you do that somebody will complain or sue you and you just have to judge your, your threshold of risk. I have a good lawyer. <laughs> And I always tell everyone that I got, if you get in trouble, I have a good lawyer to help you because you kind of need one in this business. Mm -hmm. There's some chance that someone will get sore at you no matter how careful you are. Anyway, and then Caitlin's got astroturfing. Right, and this is what we were talking about earlier where one of the biggest issues on the internet uh, and with like social media is not that, that people get into their little bubbles. It's that those bubbles are specifically you know, and consciously created and, and, and nurtured uh, by astroturfers who are usually large, well-funded organizations who know how to get people to do what they want them to do, right? A lot of research goes into this. Uh, if you think about like marketing, for example, uh, like how much research goes into making sure that people like buy your product, where to put it on their shelves, et cetera. And the same thing goes to political campaigns and uh, things of a similar na nature. And you know, we, we, one of the things that's most difficult is we're living in a society where people seem to be living in different realities. 
And I think it, it's very natural to sort of look at that and say, well, those people, they should have, you know, they should be more critical of their news. And these are a bunch of conspiracy theorists, but, you know, we're really not talking about how a lot of these conspiracy theories and how a lot of these, um, a, a lot of the effect of, of people becoming, you know, radicalized in, into believing these out there ideas is the result of very conscious and very deliberate um, actions on, on the part of, of very well-funded organizations to create uh, astroturfed campaigns. And this yeah. is what the article goes, goes over. I um, mean, it's extremely popular. It's been uh, the popularity of these AstroTurf campaigns online have been growing since about 2012. Um, there are at least 53 uh, influences targeting 24 countries from you know, 2013 to 2018 and even more you know, going on since. Um, I mean, this is, this is the real problem that we're dealing with. It's not individual peoples being misinformed. It's deliberate misinformation um, you know, and, and deliberate bubbles being formed to, you know, keep people from being um, more informed. Yeah, and I think a lot of this started with the cigarettes. They had, I'll make a campaign to make people not think cigarettes cause cancer, and then they moved it to believe there's no problem with burning fossil fuel, no global warming. These uh, disinformation campaigns tied to advertising became, it became a science, how to create a belief out there based on nothing. Right, and it, it did not take long for the politicians to, to you know, latch on to these corporate, you know, disinformation campaigns, and now we're just living in a world where people believe whatever they want, and we need to figure out a way to, to stop it. Um, and one of the reasons I bring this up is because it turns out that Russia, apparently, um, a a Russian, a former Russian spy. Uh, mentioned that in the 80s and probably continuing onward, the Russians have been targeting uh, wealthy and successful business people in America, you know, trying to, you know, woo them and, and get them to, you know, uh, parrot uh, sort of Russian ideas, you know, in, in, in media as, as influencers, so to speak. Yeah. No, and, I saw that. Yeah, and I saw the, the one of them said that they specifically targeted Trump and been grooming him for decades because he was particularly willing to repeat Russian misinformation, which he always has been. And he had a huge uh, reluctance to criticize anything about Russia all through his presidency. So uh, he may be a Manchurian candidate, but even if not, this is absolutely an interest. And it's very hard to figure out what to do about it because the people that believe this stuff like QAnon, you can't just throw the truth at them. They will just reject it. Right. Um... Yeah, I mean, they they are as much victims as as they are perpetrators in, in this whole thing. Um, yeah, sure. It's, uh, some of them have gone on to to do um, things like storm the Capitol, um, which which is why it's it's actually kind of important that we hold the people that really stoked the flames, you know, accountable. I'm not going to mention who that was, um, but we we do need to we do need to have some accountability at the top and not just go after the, the people have been, who have been duped into believing things that just aren't true. That would be nice, but I think it is extremely clear that it is absolutely not going to happen. <laughs> so uh, it is a, in the world of politics, there seem to be no consequences at all. Um, that's the dirty part of it. And that is tough. I don't know what we can do about it. But I mean, the, the point of politics is your real punishment is supposed to be when the people vote you out. But the people love this. They're all behind it. They think this is wonderful. Maybe we should join politics. What's that? Maybe we should join politics. We should join politics? Become politicians. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, boy, that would be great. I'd be washed out in a minute. I mean, it's a totally different skill set than all this autistic numerical stuff I do. You know, like you have to be able to talk to people about sports teams and pretend that you actually know or care and stuff like that. It seems to be all about making small talk and lying to people. You see, I don't have, you don't have well, these skills. We'll put a, we'll put a hologram of you up to, to do all that for you. You wouldn't want anybody looks like me either. You know, this is totally not my field. <laughs> you need other people. To do <laughs> this. Yeah, no, that's that's the one thing about politics that I just can't do. Um, and I, uh, yeah, no, I can't I can't lie to people well enough. I, I'm I'm just too honest to, to unfortunately be good at politics. Um, so that's I just what have teachers to are. See, teachers provide the truth, and politicians provide lies to influence people, mm -hmm. with a very few exceptions. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I went to a Splunk conference and they had a morning of like management and the evening was, and the afternoon was hands-on. And I'm glad they had good internet connection because the entire morning, three hours, they had some guy in a suit up there talking and he talked for three hours and didn't say one thing. Not, there's not one bit of data. And I was just sort of amazed. I said, there's something going on here that is apparently important and I'm not getting a word of it. It might as well be in a foreign language. There's something these politician types do that is apparently important that just passes over me. And I think this is what it is to be on the autistic spectrum. There's some kind of emotional connection he's creating with people that totally misses me. And I feel like this is madness and I don't even know why I'm here. It reminds me when I was in high school, I went to football games and these people are screaming and yelling at, at, at rallies before the football games. They made me go in the, and I said, I don't want to be here. These people are insane. This is a mob. They're going to kill someone. And they're all thinking this is wonderful. And I'm thinking, this is horrible. I don't want to be here. <laughs> There's something about this tribal herd, emotional connection that I don't have. And that's what politics seems to be based on. And that mob that stormed the Capitol, they all believed this thing. They all worked together. They were all sure they were right. They were held together like a school of fish to all move together by this emotional connection. Anyway. So I think we got uh, another one from uh, Collapse OS. Yeah, I just need an explanation. I didn't really understand this. Collapse OS is the operating system at the intersection of preppers and retro computing. <laughs> so what the hell is that? <laughs> Come again? Well, this uh, you have to read the the uh, this this uh, author's screed on the website to fully understand to fully grasp Collapse OS. But as it says right there at the top, winter is coming and Collapse OS aims to soften the blow. The author is convinced that we are at the precipice of civilizational collapse and that by the year 2030, these global supply chains will have collapsed. And what and we that need it will no longer be possible to purchase new computers or for that matter, microprocessors and microcontrollers. And so when that happens, and by the way, that's going to happen, it's bound to happen because of one, peak oil, and two, uh, moral collapse. So I assume the MCU people. here is the Marvel comic universe. Is that what that is? <laughs> yeah, it might as well be. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, microcontroller it, units. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to survive this collapse, am I? I could already no. tell I'm not the right guy. <laughs> You're not, Sam, because apparently you don't know how to program Zilog Z80s. Zilog? Which, <laughs> yeah. You didn't which, make that up? What is a Zilog? Well, Oh, Z80. I remember Z80s. I yeah, put Z80s. the ones after them, 6502s. Yeah, so you have to go back to about circa 1980 so that your technology is, yeah. is you know, about up to speed. Oh, a but Trash 80. Oh, my guys. God. This is the first time I've ever heard anybody recommend a Trash 80 for any purpose at all in my entire life. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is really the ideal operating system because... Um, <laughs> It's designed for these ancient, at this point, truly ancient microprocessor designs that are ubiquitous now. Uh, In junk and files. so you, you yeah. can scavenge them from all kinds of electronics. With floppies? Are, yeah, 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 right, floppies. floppies? What the hell? <laughs> but how are they SD better? Cards and SD cards. Can't forget the SD cards. How, are, how in the world can anybody think five and a quarter inch floppies are like good in any way compared to like USB drives? <laughs> well, uh, I can't explain. Okay. You have to read, you have to read the, 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 the screen that this author has, has posted. But mm. uh, keep in mind that the author has a very particular worldview and a very particular view of software. Uh, the author has stopped using GitHub because that adds too much complexity. And so everything is just hosted on this website instead yeah well i kind of do that too actually for the same reason because his, my skills oh, wow. seem to date from about the same time period <laughs> <laughs> well this is i the, mean i use github os for you sam it, i'm not you know, proud of it the way this guy is <laughs> <laughs> but it's only three thousand lines long and it's written in fourth 
So it's got to be good. Has anybody ever written any fourth? I don't even think I know what fourth looks like. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know it. Myself. Fourth don't know was from was it. really from like 1980 or something, right? There was also yeah. the first the first AI was written in some horrible language, not fourth, but um, Lisp, wasn't it? Lisp, another one of those crazy languages yeah. that I never understood. Yeah, so you know, you have ancient languages like COBOL are having a resurgence. That one I like. Yeah, yeah. So you know, fourth is is a neighbor to that. So okay. why not? Yeah. So what's the web emulator? Yeah. So there's somebody's actually created a web emulator for Collapse OS. Um, I don't know how to make it do anything, <laughs> but if you go to that web emulator, it seems to do something. It seems to work. It will allow you to load code among other things. So this is if a Raspberry Pi is like too powerful for you, you go back to like a Z80. Yes. It's it's all about the eight bit. You well, know what really this liked writing eight bit code it was fun but I can't recommend it really yeah. Yeah, you know what this reminds me of this reminds me of Temple OS. Temple. Oh, Temple OS, yeah. Temple yes, OS. Sam, do you know what Temple OS is? Yeah, I do. Yes, it does remind me of that too. Yeah. Okay. So, so some, I, I, I the guy passed away, but um, uh, this yeah Terry Davis. Terry Davis was a, a man who. Uh, unfortunately had a schizophrenia and he thought that God was giving him commandments to write an operating system and he wrote it, the operating system called Temple OS because it was apparently like one of the temples described in the Bible and it, like everything is built up from scratch to be unique like it's not a like Unix based operating system it, it's its own thing and it runs on x86 PCs um, and it is just this wonderful mess <laughs> of an operating system um, that doesn't do too much, uh, but it has this Bible themes all over the place. And yeah, the guy was a brilliant coder, uh, but a, you know, it's the, a side effect of being brilliant is oftentimes, you know, <laughs> a little bit of crazy, but. Um, I wouldn't yeah. know anything about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about it either. So, um, but yeah, no, Temple OS was another another operating system written by someone who um, sort of believed in some pretty strange things. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just want to point out that Temple OS is not fit for civilizational collapse because it uses a GUI. Oh yeah. Well, I you know I remember this argument. GUIs kind of suck. I like headless cloud servers with no GUI. Who needs a stinking mouse? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, well, that's a good one. All right. Well, now I feel enlightened. And uh, even though it's clear that I won't survive the collapse of society, it's not bothering me much. Well, we've got nine years to figure it out. Oh, there's a date when society collapses? Yes, 20, 2030 is when the global supply chains that we rely on, at least for electronics, will collapse. And did he figure that out from like the Mayan calendar or something? Uh, no, it's just because of peak oil, which I thought that was over a decade ago, but peak oil and 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 moral decay. Moral I decay. There's yeah. a well-known time for moral decay. <laughs> yes. Yes. The morality is decaying faster than ever, and it's almost at the tipping point. So so peak oil occurred um, unceremoniously in uh, 2019. Uh, right before you know 2020, and we all stopped uh, uh, oil usage dramatically. Um, uh, so we didn't plan for 2019 to be peak oil. No one expected it to be two, you know, but, peak but oil. That's but that's what we're saying now is that 2019 was peak oil. Apparently, yeah. That's oh, okay. that was ever since because 2020, you know, obviously there was a lot less oil usage, um, and now and now uh, solar. And renewable resources are actually cheaper than coal and oil-based power. Um, and GM is going to be shifting to all electric production. Right yeah, it looks. Yeah, 2019 was <laughs> peak oil. No one noticed. Okay, so I guess but, that part's true. Half of it's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, it I might all be true because I think one thing I've heard people say is that they're not going to make all these airplane trips to go to business meetings anymore. They've all learned from the pandemic that you don't really need to. So the rate of like traps and driving and flying will probably never really pick up to what it was. I don't know if that's true, but it might be. Well, I, I guess we're just waiting for the moral decay to come through then. 
Well, some of us are waiting with bated breath for the end of the moral decay. I mean, after the 1918 pandemic, they had the roaring 20s. Oh, and yeah. so there should be another period of wild, you know, moral outrage and orgies and radical spending of all that vast amount of money you made on Bitcoin and stuff. There should right. be a real uh, outpouring of moral decadence coming out when, when we get the vaccine later this year. Yes. I, I, for, I, for one, am, am looking forward to the return of the speakeasy. Yeah, that should be like that. Yeah. Except now it'll be with uh, legal pot anyway. So. Sorry, the coffee's, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> freezing, well, freezing pot. Well, yeah. All right. Well, any more comments? Well, I'm going to stop this one.